Thanks, Gail. I think that perfectly responds to Tinica's call earlier for a more holistic interdisciplinary approach and shows us just the value of such an approach. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Kerry Bradshaw, and she's going to talk about the relationship between environmental voices and environmental process. Thanks, Kerry. Does that work? Great. Um, okay, so the proposal that I'm going to make today involves mandating environmental management systems via company law. And I should emphasize quite strongly that there is a limit to what EMSs can achieve. And what I'm presenting today is part of that broader jigsaw puzzle of reform that Beata mentioned at the beginning. And there's a few ways that you can look at environmental management systems in terms of their purpose. And one way to look at them is as a possible framework for a sort of environmental due diligence that Andrew mentioned this morning. Um, or the good practice benchmarking that Bland had mentioned earlier. Um, they also offer a way in which we might operationalize that broader corporate purpose to respect the environment that was mentioned before. So they fit part of that puzzle. <clears throat> but if implemented properly and with a robust framework for doing so, and with lessons from the regulatory scholarship that underpins these, these systems, environmental management systems can be so much more than due diligence or compliance. And in my view, one of the aims of mandating an environmental management system should be to open up within corporations a deliberative space for the consideration of environmental concerns, or to amplify what I term in the paper, intra-corporate environmental voice. And this, in turn, would allow for the more meaningful integration of environmental concerns into company decision-making than is presently the case under the Companies Act in the UK, in particular under Section 172. And I know integration into environmental decision-making is something that the Sustainable Companies Project has been quite interested in. I should talk a little bit about what I mean by environmental voice, and I spell it out in a bit more detail in the paper. But it stems from the fact that the environment, unlike other corporate stakeholders, cannot voice its concerns on its own. It requires advocates to speak for it. And the starting point for locating a voice for the environment within corporations is the real individuals who comprise business organizations. And there's plenty of, area, plenty of areas of research that suggest we can sort of hear whispers of environmental voice. So Andrew, I think, was making a suggestion to quite a lot of psychological evidence that, generally speaking, people do want to do the right thing and say the right thing. Um, in the environmental compliance literature, um, empirical scholarship suggests that normative or internalized commitments to environmental protection do exist. The problem is, is that organizational life in corporations and a number of factors that go along with group decision making can serve to mute environmental voices, to mute environmental concerns. <clears throat> and so what I think environmental lawyers and corporate lawyers should be thinking about is way in which procedural approaches to environmental law can restrict those muting factors on voice, can open up space where environmental concerns are deliberated upon and voiced. <clears throat> and one of the main problems with UK company law at the moment is that existing processes don't really achieve that purpose. So procedural law in general tries to create structures which are more indirect than traditional command and control, and they try to make corporations and the people with them think about their environmental impacts. In section 172, which we've heard of a little bit this morning already, and what I think is going to be discussed quite a lot this afternoon, is a somewhat weak example of an environmental procedure. And this is primarily because, as was suggested this morning, section 172 mandates a business case approach to the environment. <clears throat> and the business case, business case approach to the environment is the idea that behaving responsibly pays, that you can do well by the environment as well as making profits at the same time. And unfortunately, and unlike what a lot of regulatory scholars or advocates of procedural law would suggest, is that procedures actually need to be much more open than this. They need to, instead of forcing decision-making down the win-win, down the business case approach, need to be open to the scope for conflict 
between environmental goals and corporate goals. And I think, as Beata suggested this morning, that those conflicts are routine and deeply embedded, and we need much more than a business case or status quo um, approach to the environment. And Section 172 doesn't really involve that type of magnitudinal shift that we need. Robust environmental management systems, in contrast, have the potential to perform much better. And in the paper, I use the EU's eco-management and audit scheme as an example of what EMS regulation might look like. Um, the scheme currently runs at the voluntary level, and it's very detailed. A lot of the detail is quite dry, so I won't bore you with that in the presentation. But broadly speaking, environmental management systems, and particularly the one in EMAS, provide a framework for setting up a number of internal, recursive, and reflective processes within businesses, encouraging them to adopt a critical approach to their uh, impact on the environment and to reflect seriously on those impacts. So, in order to register with EMAS, companies must first carry out a comprehensive environmental review. And as was suggested in, in the first presentation this morning, not all companies do that. Um, and it also must include indirect and direct aspects. So this review involves looking at what the environmental impacts are in the supply chain. And again, we heard the importance of that this morning. On the basis of this review, companies must write an environmental policy. And unlike some of the ones that you see in the, the makeup of the ugliest, uh, CS, ugliest companies, this does have to include quantifiable performance objectives, not wishy-washy commitments to the environment. The policy is formally expressed by top management and the self-setting of, of environmental goals is quite important given that the regulatory scholarship in this area generally suggests that the environment, that the procedures should be geared to an environmental norm rather than that corporate goal of financial success which is what section 172 is geared towards. <coughs> um, and the policy and the review lead to what's called the management system, which outlines the programs for implementing that policy. And the system is based around the, the iterative and re recursive plan, do, check act, check, act methodology. So if something comes up that's going wrong, then uh, either via review or audit, then managers should take remedial action, not just to their operations, but also to the management scheme and the policy and the process itself. It, EMAS also includes mechanisms to make sure that environmental policy or environmental voice radiates or is heard across the organization at varying levels of hierarchy. So it, with directors, top level management and lower level employees. And environment, environmental management, management systems therefore are quite holistic and deal with some of the concerns mentioned earlier about how environmental concerns can be fragmented across an organization if they're not properly housed. <clears throat> and another important aspect of, of EMAS environmental management systems is that not only must they be internally audited, but they must be externally verified by an accredited verifier. And this is the enforcement aspect of environmental management systems. And again, enforcement of this environmental due diligence duty was, was something that was mentioned this morning. How much time do I have? One minute. <laughs> um, there's a limit to what they can achieve, as I suggest, but there's some very interesting empirical data which is emerging that suggests that these routines that radiate, as I said, at all levels of the, of the organization can mean that the environment receives stronger presence in the firm's decision-making processes, allowing for the discursive expression of ideas that might have been repressed without a rigorous system. Um, and to deal with, and this, this hints at what Gail was just talking about, ways in which to deal with internal and external economic and environmental demands and to find new mechanisms for resolving the tensions between them. So while they're not a complete algorithm for that difficult environment versus financial tension, they do involve processes which make decision-making more sensitive to environmental concerns. <clears throat> so for practical reasons, I think that they are quite a useful framework 
by way to operationalize any sort of director's duty to the environment. And that sort of environment could be complemented by a duty to ensure the proper implementation of an environmental management system. And we might use EMAS as an example of what the legal regulation for that might look like. Thank you.